Now then, let's talk about God's Word and what God wants us to hear today. U.S. Today, USA Today, had an article a good while back, and that article was about the richest and wealthiest people in America, and it asked the question, what would they pay the most for? And uh, these people are in the 1% in the country, and their number one desire, the number one thing that they would buy or want to buy is not beauty, not intellect, not power, or even love. They said that they would pay the most for the assurance that they would have a place in heaven. And not only that, but according to them, the average price that they would be willing to pay was $640,000. You believe that? Crazy, isn't it? I mean, the fact of the matter is that we're all concerned about dying. Billy Graham was asked, of all the presidents in the five decades that you were uh, uh, an evangelist and, and meeting with the presidents, which one did you meet with the most? His answer may surprise you. He said, Lyndon Baines Johnson. And then he said, LBJ was afraid of dying. The fact of the matter is, we're all going to die. We don't like to think about it, but we're going to die. So let me ask you this question. You die, and then you're standing before God. And God says to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? Good question. I've, I've used that question many, many times in sharing the plan of salvation or the gospel of, of salvation to folks. What would you say? Well, hopefully the message today will help you to understand a little bit more about that. And uh, God hopefully will prepare you so that you will have uh, the right answer. We're beginning today a series of messages of personalities around the cross. And our scripture today is in the Gospel of Luke, and it's in chapter 23. And we're going to be looking each week at different ones at the cross. And today, we're looking at the thieves, uh, those two men that were crucified with Christ. You know, of course, that uh, the Scripture tells us here in verse 32 of Luke 23, and two others also who were criminals were being led away to be put to death with him. And verse 33, and when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals one on the right and the other on the left. Now look down to verse 39. And one of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him, said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of, we are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he, that is Jesus, said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So these two men were crucified with Jesus. Now, it's interesting. I don't know if... Uh, you know, they were just caught up. Jesus was going to be crucified, and so they decided to, to crucify these two guys with him. Or if perhaps they were waiting, and now Jesus comes, and so they said, well, we can get three for one here. Get, get, get them all at one time. I don't know. But I know this. It was not coincidental. The fact that these men were crucified with Jesus was the fulfillment of Scripture. Jesus, in Luke twenty two thirty seven, 37, the previous chapter, quotes Isaiah 53, 12, and it says, It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And Jesus says, I tell you that, you must, that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. So what we find then is that this was the fact that these men were crucified with Christ was already predetermined by God in advance. And just another indication of how Jesus fulfills the Scripture, the uh, uh, prophecies in the Old Testament. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot about these guys. We know very little about them. But we learn, what we can learn from this is 
about salvation. So here's what I, I want you to go away with today. Two men, two criminals were crucified with Christ. One of them was a blasphemer, and the other one was a believer. Now the question is, which one represents you? Which one symbolizes you, a blasphemer or a believer? So as we look at this, there, there are two criminals. Now, it's interesting that the word that Luke is using here is a word that also can be translated malfactor. And it has the implication of a worker of evil. And when you look at Matthew and in Mark and, 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 and compare them, what they use is the word robber. But it's not the word of one who pilfers or steals. Rather, it is someone who is a plunderer. This kind, it is, it's harsh word. The indication is that these men were hardened criminals. Now, they perhaps were a member of a Jewish marauding band that would function something like terrorists today. That's a good, I think, parallel. They were constantly harassing and doing everything they could to drive the Romans out of the land of Palestine, their homeland. And so Chuck Swindoll suggests that they may have been associated with Barabbas, who was released instead of Jesus at, at the time that Pilate uh, was releasing one. And so they, they were probably guilty of stealing and of killing. If it was stealing, not everybody who stole was sentenced to die. In the Old Testament, when someone stole, there was a process called restitution. You could be, it could restore it. And an example of that is Zacchaeus. You remember when Jesus went home with Zacchaeus and Zacchaeus stand, stood up and he began to speak, but Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor and I, if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times as much. So if it was a matter of thievery, they could have done restitution. But it must have been something beyond that. Perhaps they were repeat offenders. Or perhaps they killed someone in the process of the robbery. We don't know. But one of them, the one that ultimately gives his life to Christ, admits, we indeed justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. So this man leaves no question about the guilt and the, the crimes that they have done. In a, in a crazy kind of way, you know, they kind of represent us. I know you probably don't want to think about that. But the fact of the matter is, all of us have broken the law. Every one of us. The Bible tells us all have sinned. And so all of us have broken the law. Now, we don't think about it very much. I heard about this uh, teacher that asked his, her, her fifth grade class, if you found a, a, a suitcase or a bag that had $500,000 in it, what would you do? The implication is, would you give it back? Would you find, or would you just keep it? What would you do? Well, one of the little fellas thought about it for a minute, and then he said, well, if it belonged to a poor family, I'd give it back. <laughs> Think that through. <laughs> I mean, the fact of the matter is, though, that we're all guilty. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you've never done anything like this, okay? We're talking about stealing. And so if you have never taken any change out of your mother's purse, if you have never sneaked into a movie or a ball game without paying, if you've never stolen an answer from somebody else's test paper, if you've never hedged on your expense account, if you've never taken a towel from a motel or a T-shirt or socks from the athletic program, if you've never cheated on your income tax report, raise your hand. Conclusion, all of us have sinned. All of us have broken the Eighth Commandment, thou shalt not steal. And so in a, in a, in a way, th these men, we condemn them, they're criminals, they're being crucified, but the fact of the matter is all of us deserve to die. The wages of sin is death. That's what God's Word says in, in Romans 6, 23. And in Ezekiel, it says, the soul that sinneth shall die. 
In other words, those who sin, they deserve to die. You and I deserve to die. But Jesus died in your place and in my place so we then could experience and have mercy. We, we were saved by mercy and by grace and mercy. In Titus, Paul writes it this way. He saved us, talking about Jesus saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. Now, let's just stop for a moment here. It is amazing how many people think that if they just do enough good, then they're going to be uh, able to go to heaven. And so you stand before Jesus, why should I let you into my heaven? Well, I did a lot of good things. This verse says, he saved us not on the basis of the things we've done, but look at it, but according to his mercy, out of, out by his mercy, according to the, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And so these men are criminals, and they are suffering on the cross. Do you ever think about this? We talk about Jesus' suffering. Did you know they're suffering the same way? Their hands and their feet are nailed to the cross. And so they're enduring that pain. Their lungs are screaming for air as they try to breathe just like Jesus. Not only that, their legs are cramping and their lips are parched because of dehydration. They're going through all of this because of their sin. That's the consequence of their failure. And you and I should have to go through that same thing, but we don't because Jesus paid the price for us. If we receive him, then we do not have to go through that. And so these men are suffering. But you know there are a lot of people today suffering. Congregation this size, there are people suffering here. There are senior adults that have gotten to the place, like me, that your back's hurting and you can't walk real good sometimes. <laughs> you know, the whole point is this, this house we live in begins to tear down. And, and it has to be maintained. Not only that, but you got all kinds of sickness around us. Right now, there's a real scare about the coronavirus. I mean, but there are, it's, it, flu kills way, way more people than the coronavirus. The fact is, there are people that right now are experiencing the flu, and they, they have to be careful, because, and that could go into pneumonia, and that could kill them. The whole point I'm making is that we, there are times when we suffer. We suffer the same hurts that are reflected in the community. Divorce, addiction, children that do not want to do what they're supposed to do, and sometimes parents who abuse their children. And so the whole point I'm making is that suffering is constantly with us. I mean, the Bible tells us that man's born of woman is a short of days and full of trouble. And so the reality is this. Jesus identified with the suffering of these men because he was enduring the same thing they were, and he identifies with your suffering as well. Sometimes we get the idea, well, God, you just don't understand what's going on. You don't understand how bad it is. I'm here to tell you something. He does, because the Word of God says it this way in the book of Hebrews. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tested in every way as we are, yet without sin. So the whole point here is, whatever you're going through, Jesus is fully aware of it, and not only that, he is with you in it, and he will sustain you through it if you simply will put your faith and trust in him. And so these men, these criminals... One on the left, one on the right are being crucified with Christ. They're dying because they have sinned. And you and I, unless we come to Christ, will die in our sin and we will suffer for eternity, as we'll see in a minute, uh, because of it. So let's look at these men. One of them became a blasphemer. On the cross, what, he, what we find is that they were hurling abuse at him. And one of the criminals in verse 39 who were hanging there was uh, uh, hurling abuse at him, saying, You're not, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. And so this man is uh, hurling abuse. In fact, according to Matthew, originally both of them were. In verse 44 and 27, uh, chapter 27, in the same way the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. 
And again in Mark 20, uh, 15, 32, let this Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Now you would think that because they are in a, they're, they're, they're suffering a common thing, that they're enduring, going through this together, that it would have bonded them together. But that's not what happened. What we find is that this fellow is criticizing, blaspheming Christ and denying who he is. I read an interesting thing. Uh, Chuck Colson, of course, established uh, the prison fellowship. And uh, one of his associates said one time that you would think that when prisoners are put in prison, that the fellow prisoners would commiserate with them. But he said that is not true. When a new person comes in, particularly if the person is well-known, and particularly if that person is an individual of faith, and if that person is young, they said then the other prisoners, they are very cynical, and they do everything that they can to harass those individuals. They do all that they can. Jesus met all three of those characteristics. He was well-known. He was relatively young. And he was a man of faith. And so this fellow attacks him, he blasphemes him, and so what we find is that the cross made him more bitter than he was earlier. You know, I got thinking about this. How did this guy wind up here? For that matter, how do all of us wind up where we are? Did he come from a bad home? Did he learn to steal early and got away with it, and so he just got worse and worse and worse? Was it that he was hanging out with the wrong people, bad companions, corrupt good morals, Paul writes. So the whole idea is we don't know the answer to that and, and, and a lot of other questions. But here's the thing. What we do understand is this man, by the time he's on that cross, is a hardened sinner. And even in the face of death, he continues to rebel against God. And sometimes, if we're not careful, suffering can make us bitter. The old saying is, suffering will either make you bitter or better, right? And sometimes people who go through a time of intense tri trial, they, they dig deep in their faith, and, they, and they're stabilized, and they're, they're sustained. I mean, sometimes when you face those kinds of things, it makes you turn to God. I know that in my experience, when I got my leg burnt that time, it began to, uh, I began to think about God where I wasn't thinking about him before. But one fellow pointed out to me, the sun, the heat of the sun will melt butter, but it will also harden clay. And so it just depends upon the stuff itself. And, and, and so a cross experience, sometimes going through times of trial has had a negative effect on people. For example, dear lady, young lady, child died. Devastated her. She, she just refused to accept it, really. I mean, she kept the, the child's clothes the same, wouldn't let anybody touch them. She wouldn't let anybody come and talk to her about God or how God would be with her. I mean, she just completely rebelled against everything, and she's told them, don't tell me that God is good. Another situation where this little boy died, and his mother reacted the same way. I mean, she, she says, you know, don't tell me that God answers prayer. I prayed for my son to live, and he didn't live. And so she turned her heart against God. She blamed God. She accused God. And she didn't want anybody from the church to even come see her. Now, what I'm trying to illustrate to you is that you and I have the choice. We have the capacity to go one way or the other. This man becomes bitter. There are other people who've gone through those same kinds of experiences, and they can get on the other side of it and look back and say, that was so heavy and so hard, and I never, ever want to go through anything like that again. But I know that God was with me in the middle of it. And that's what you want. And God will, in fact, bring you through. And so, Jesus, you know, an interesting thing, that guy is blaspheming Jesus. How does Jesus respond to him? Does he react to him? Does he 
you know, throw it back on him? Not at all. Isn't that interesting? I mean, Jesus is suffering just like that fellow, except much more, because that fellow was suffering for his sin. Who was Jesus suffering for? The sin of the world. He had your sin and my sin on his shoulders, as we sang a while ago. And yet, in spite of all of that, Jesus does not react to this individual. And I want you to know, he understood his suffering, and he understands your suffering. And when you and I say and act and do some things in the midst of our hurt, he understands. It's okay. And when we come to our senses, so to speak, we come back to him and say, God, I'm so sorry. You have not changed in your character, but I have certainly gone through something that's had an impact on my character. God never changes. His love is constant. He is with you always, and that will never, ever change. Listen to some music on the message this morning coming in. I am a child of God. That's who I am. And God says that's who I am. And so, my dear friend, what I'm trying to tell you is don't let the hard experiences in life turn you against God, but rather be like this other fellow who turned to God. Scripture tells us that this man became a believer. He repented, and he turned to Christ in faith. Interesting, isn't it? Both of them are hanging on the cross. Originally, he's taunting Jesus. Then he defends Jesus. He says to the, his compadre, you know, don't you fear God? I mean, we're suffering for our sin. This man's done nothing. He defends Jesus. And then finally, he trusts Jesus. He gives his heart and his life to Christ. What in the world happened? How could this take place? Well, I think there are probably several contributing factors. Number one is that he watched Jesus die. He saw Jesus suffer. He saw the folks that were railing against him, spitting on him, those that were, you know, accusing him, and yet he saw how Jesus received that without reacting. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 2.23, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. In other words, instead of reacting to the circumstances, Jesus entrusts himself to the Father who he understands and knows is going to ultimately do everything that's right. And that's what you and I need to do as well. Trust God in the midst of it all. It had an impact on this guy. And you know what I think? I am convinced that when you and I endure hardships, and we do it in the same spirit that Jesus did of faith and trust in God, I think it will influence people around us. As I've said so many times through these years, your light never shines brighter than in your darkest hour. People can see that Jesus makes a difference in life. Not only that, but he heard the prayer of Jesus. I mean, you remember on the cross, Jesus offers a couple of prayers, but one of them was, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Here are these people who have nailed him to the cross. Here are these people who are accusing him and ridiculing him. Here are these people that are scoffing him and mocking him. But Jesus prays, Father, forgive them. And so he becomes... Jesus is not an ordinary person. He is, he's not your average individual dying on the cross, and it impacts his life. Not only that, it caused him to change his mind. He repented. That word repent in the original language has the idea of metanoia, and it's meta to change, noose his mind. He changed his mind. He became convinced that Jesus was, in fact, who he said he was, the Messiah. And consequently, he was willing to put his faith and trust in Christ. Now, think through this with me. What did he, he's on, he is on the cross. I mean, he's moments 
I say moments. He is some short period away from death. But he accepts Christ. How do I know that? Well, there are several evidences of his repentance. First of all, he respects and fears God. He says to the other guy, don't you fear God? Now, what it indicates is he did. He acknowledged that God was real and that fearing God was critical. Proverbs 9.10 says that fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What that means is acknowledging the reality of God, accepting the fact that one day you have to stand to face God. And, and so this man is conscious of that reality. And so he, he, he said, you know, the second verse in Amazing Grace is an interesting it says, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear." "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved." The beginning is to know and acknowledge God. The second thing is that he admitted his sin. If you're going to be saved, if you're going to accept Christ, then you have to admit you're all accountable to God. Then you have to acknowledge your sin. What he says is, we indeed justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. In our world today, uh, too many people want to justify. They want to, to have an excuse for their sin. But the Bible says you have to admit, Lord, it's me. I'm the one. And when you do that, you've taken a second step of the indication that you're moving towards salvation. The third thing that I see here is that he believed the truth about Jesus. Here's an interesting thing. He says, this man has done no wrong. He is innocent. He has done no wrong. He's dying not for himself, but for your sin and my sin. He's done no wrong. Pilate said, I find no fault in him. Judas went out and hanged himself because he had, you know, had caused the shedding of innocent blood. Jesus was sinless, but he was dying on a cross in fulfilling what God had planned for him to take the sins of the world upon himself, knowing that one day he was going to be raised from the dead. And we have to put our faith and trust in Jesus. I mean, I love the scripture that uh, in, in John 11 you remember that Martha and Mary both, but Martha went out first, and she says to him, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even if he dies. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he says, do you believe this? And she says, yes. Lord, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Now, here's, here's what I want you to understand. We reverence God, we acknowledge God, we admit our sin, and then we admit and accept the truth. Jesus is God's appointed Savior, and we put our faith and our trust in him, and when we trust him, then we have salvation. How do I know this man trusted Jesus? He says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, remember, Jesus is right there beside him, dying. Where in the world is he going to get a kingdom? He understood that the kingdom was not of this world, but it was a spiritual kingdom. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And so he put his faith and his trust in Christ. It's what we call a deathbed confession. I mean, at the last moment. I mean, he, he was saved by the skin of his teeth, we say. But the reality is simply this. That's not God's ultimate plan. God doesn't want us to wait till the last minute or at the last minute reach out to him. He wants you to accept him now so that you can have a full life, a meaningful life, a joyous life, and be used of God to help other people to be a part of what God's doing. That's why you need to decide today and not wait for some other time. This man barely escaped hell, but he did. Jesus says to him, what? Today you will be with me in 
paradise. The word paradise is the idea of a garden. It's a beautiful place. He says, you're going to be with me, not here on this little hill. That's barren and where this cross is, the place of the skull. You're going to, today, today you're going to be there. I mean, Paul writes to be absent from the body is to what? Be present with the Lord. Today, you will be with me in paradise. And so this man experienced the salvation that Jesus had promised. And Jesus is waiting. I read a story that has just really thrilled my heart about a little boy named Landon Whitley. You can Google him. Landon Whitley was eight years old in 1997 when his father and their family was involved in an accident. And Landon's father was killed immediately. He was severely injured. They airlifted him to a medical center not far away, and he, they had to resuscitate him three times on the way. They got him there, got brain surgery, and then he was in a coma for several weeks. And then he, he, he waked up, or he was coming out, and his mother just didn't want to tell him that his father had died. But before she could say anything, he came to his senses and he said, Mom, I died and went to heaven three times. And said, the first time that I went, I saw Jesus and the angels and they were clapping for me. He said, the second time, I saw Jesus and Dad and Dad was with Jesus. And I wanted to stay with, with, with Jesus and, and my Dad. But Jesus hugged me and told me, no, you got to go back and I want you to tell everybody about me. And he said, and the third time that I went, I saw your other two children. And she gasped. She had had two miscarriages, and she had never told Landon about any, either one of them. He said, I saw your two children. How do you explain something like that? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, I know a man 14 years ago that was caught up into the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. All I know is I was caught up and I saw things that I can't even report. And that little boy is now a man and he continues to tell people what happened in his life and how he met Jesus and that Jesus sent him back to tell everybody about him. That's what you and I need to be doing as well telling others about him. This thief, this last one, was saved by grace. I like what Alexander McLaurin said. One alone was saved upon the cross that none might despair, but only one that none might presume. And so the reality is simply this. If I were to stand before God right now, if I died and was standing before God, I wouldn't tell him, and he asked me, why should I let you into my heaven? I wouldn't tell him, well, you know, I've been preaching for 58 years. I, I wouldn't tell him, well, you know, I've, I've, I've baptized a good number of people in this period of time. I wouldn't tell him, well, you know, I've served seven different churches and did my best to be the pastor. I wouldn't tell him any of that. You know what i tell him? If he said, why should I let you into my heaven? I would say to him, because in 1962, 61, December of 1961, on the little tweed couch in my pastor's den, I asked Jesus to come into my life and to take control of my life, and he did. He saved me then, and that's why I should be allowed to go into heaven, because I am a child of God. Let's pray together. I don't know where you are in your experience, but I do know this. God has been very real to me in all these years. And I'm grateful for the salvation that I know through grace and faith. And I pray that if you do not know Jesus in this way, that you will come to him today. Give your heart, give your life to Christ. There's no greater thing, no greater joy, letting Jesus have control. And then once you bring Jesus and invite Jesus and he comes into your life, Everything from that point forward that you face, you will have the strength of Christ. We sang that song a while ago. Yet not I, but Christ in me. That can be yours. Let him have his way.